Super Bowl edition of the Crash the Pond podcast. Such a Super Bowl day that we actually have three podcasters on this time. Myself, Jake, and CJ joining the fray, joining the fracas. So hope you guys are feeling better than the Kansas City Chiefs fans <sighs> and Patrick Mahomes right now. Right, that, that, that's that's the bare minimum we should be trying to hit yeah, at this point. Yeah, I think we're going to dub this a full house pod. I think that works. Full house? Yeah. That, that, that's a bit of an antiquated reference, Jake. You're you're dating yourself a bit, which Damn I guess it. maybe is Damn a, it. apropos for this weekend for you. Yeah. Well, everywhere you look, everywhere you look. I was waiting right, for for you. I was legitimately gonna ask you, CJ, to just sing the song. So thank you. Yeah, it was my uh, my birthday yesterday, <laughs> and I'm I'm the big three zero. Thanks, Felix. Thanks, thanks a lot for for reminding me of that. Why? Whoa! whoa. <laughs> Accusatory tone to to that, but it is what it is. But yeah, so welcome everybody to the show. We've actually got plenty to discuss this week. So the Ducks played three games this week, which is a bit of a a lighter week, uh, all things considered, when we look back at some of the kind of just crazy weeks that we've had. Uh, the Ducks played two games against the San Jose Sharks, a back-to-back. Two games that, if you could find any rhyme or reason in them, uh, props to you. No, they, they, they were back-and-forth affairs uh, with the Ducks winning last night in the shootout and then an overtime, or sorry, another loss the night before that. So, And then a big win in L.A. earlier in the week. So we're going to break all of that down hope hope you guys are ready for this yeah definitely i'm i'm wondering where where the pitchforks are at currently everyone everywhere because uh last yeah. sunday's episode the pitchforks were out i don't know if mine's necessarily gone away i think there are probably people out there that maybe what? have put them away um but uh yeah i i think that uh the people may be a little bit calmer but we may actually have some reason uh for them not to be with with our little bit of recap here. Yeah, I was going to ask. So before we get into the recaps of the games, uh, what you know for both of you, what what is your mindset right now regarding this team? Because like Jake was alluding to on last week's podcast, we were very. I don't want to say. I don't think that we were being harsh or negative or you know anything like that. It was just the reality that the Ducks had had some pretty bad losses. And it was time to really discuss what is going on with this team. So now with a week, you know, removed from that and with some games that have been more competitive, where are you two just at? Where where are your emotions at regarding the state of the franchise? Go for it, CJ. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that it's frustrating right now because they have had, obviously the Kings game was a very dominant game. Um, but you know, obviously also it was the Kings, so it's hard to read too much into that in only one game. And then against the Sharks too, they had stretches of good play against the Sharks, but again, not a great team. So uh, I think a lot of us were just kind of expecting after the St. Louis and Arizona debacles that look, there might be some change coming down the line and that, you know, as Jake mentioned on Twitter, once the LA Kings game hits here if they lose and they lose badly then we could actually see this stuff starting to change and they come out and play the complete opposite they have a good stretch they pick up what six seven points seven points um uh this you know since the kings so this is still not a good team like this team isn't going to turn around and suddenly become a playoff contender i truly don't believe that and i believe that this is allowing management to kick the can down the road a little bit further. So I'm happy that they won. Like as, as somebody who supports the team and, 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 and everything, like I'm glad uh, that they played some good hockey, but at the same time, it's almost like it's just a temporary band aid on a lot of the much deeper problems running through this franchise. Yeah. And I'm kind of in the same spot real quick. I think it, they got what five points out of possible six games or five, po- five, five out, out of six, six in the five past, six. In, in this yeah. past week. Which obviously you look at that and you think that that's awesome. And I, I think the the one thing to keep in mind here, if you're a Ducks fan, is kind of what CJ said. This is the, these are the bottom of the barrel teams. And against the Kings, they looked great, and that's awesome, and they should, and, and that's what they should be doing. And I think that we need to be able to to give them credit for doing that. And I think against the Sharks, they were it was back and forth. I, I think that if you were to really have to narrow it down in that series, I think it was a pretty even series between the two, which. I guess, granted, if you want to uh, kind of break it down, 
the Ducks should be trying to be better than the Sharks right now. If you're kind of break even with that Sharks team, that's not necessarily a great thing at the end of the day. But they played better. And so the real question is, is and this is the big question for this past week, was the better play a result of improvement from the Ducks? Did we see improvement in the line? Did we see improvement from the coaching staff? Did we see improvement individual in individual performances? Or is this simply a result of playing weaker opponents? And during the first 10 games of the season, we talked about it prior to the season starting. The Ducks had a, a murderer's row of games. They, they played all of the toughest teams in the division in those first 10 games. And basically, that's put the Ducks behind. And the Ducks, realistically, what we've seen from this is where they sit is in that bottom tier of the the Pacific division. And regardless of what you want to look at the division standings right now, because right now, technically the ducks are in a wild or in the fourth spot in the division, but they have 13 points in 13 games and the wild have only played 11 games and have 12 points. The coyotes have 11 points in 11 games. And uh, even the sharks have 10 points in or 10, nine points in 10 games. So basically everyone is around similar points percentage. So it's not as if the ducks have created separation there for a playoff spot and really where they've picked up points is against the bad teams. And so they need to do that. And I think that's one thing to be said. We need to be giving them credit because they need to be picking up points in these games. And five points out of a six out of a possible six will go a long way for a team that is quote unquote in win now mode trying to make the playoffs. The question is whether they continue that type of pace against the teams they have to be. We saw it against the Coyotes. They did not look this good against the Coyotes. And so as of right now, I don't know if my opinion has necessarily changed. Maybe last week I would have thought they're the bottom of the barrel team in the entire Pacific. Now I don't really believe that. Um, I think that if I had to separate it, I would probably put that there's obviously the top two in the division where you've got the the Colorados and Vegas, and then or Colorado and Vegas. Then you probably have St. Louis and Minnesota in a tier below that. Arizona kind of all on their own tier. Ducks and Sharks in the same, and then the Kings way below that. And that's kind of where I would put it right now. And I think that even though it's a good thing they won these games, I think that the Shark series really showed that they're in that same ballpark as compared to being in the wild ballpark, as compared to even being in the Coyotes ballpark right now. And there's a lot of hockey to still be played, but it's a short season. And uh, we've seen 13 games. And what is now I'll do the quick math. 13 over 56 is it's more than 10% of the season so far. I know that for for a fact. It's twenty, almost a quarter of the season actually. Twenty three percent of the season is gone. That's actually kind of yeah. wild to think about. Um, so overall, my opinion hasn't necessarily changed on them. I, I think the the real test is going to be um, the upcoming few weeks, honestly, for this Ducks team as they play the Vegas Golden Knights on Tuesday, because that's where we'll really get a test to see is this improved play. Or was it simply playing a poor team? And I think that is the key question for this team moving forward. So what's interesting about that, by the way, sorry, uh, 23% of an 82-game season would be about almost roughly 19 games in. And so I think that if you're valuing a team in a normal year, when you're closing in on that 20-game mark, you're feeling like it's it's fair to start making some assessments about the team, right? So Mm -hmm. we're... We're in that range now, but regarding the upcoming schedule, like you already brought up, they play Vegas on Tuesday. They play Vegas again on Thursday, and those are their only two games next week. They have a really light schedule next week. After that, they play San Jose once, Minnesota twice, and then Arizona twice. So that's an interesting stretch to me because Vegas is going to be a huge test. We already kind of know how that tends to go. San Jose feels like a bit of a toss-up even though they have picked up three out of four possible points against them this season and then you've got minnesota and you know we don't really know yet what that's going to look like and then you've got the arizona games so the what's interesting about this division for the ducks and maybe i'm wrong about this but it seems like there's not really any in between you have this cluster of teams that are retooling rebuilding not that great right now and then everybody else is feels like a pretty legitimate playoff team, I would say. Um, I mean, from the Minnesota, St. Louis, Vegas, Colorado, these are all teams that are have a legitimate claim to a playoff spot. And then maybe the only kind of in-between team would be Arizona. Am, am I off on that? It, it feels like there's a pretty big divide between where the teams are at in their 
own timeline in this division. Yeah. Arizona, I, I, th- I think, is in this really weird kind of purgatory of, like, yes. they're not quite good. At, I feel like they're mm-hmm. almost like the Wild were a few years ago, where they're just barely good enough to potentially put, get into the playoffs, but they're not going to go very far. And they don't yeah. have a whole lot of a prospect pipeline that's really up and coming. So it, it, they're in this really weird thing. And I think we're seeing this closer now and this is what i think all three of us have been um talking about for a few years now is that you know up until these last couple of drafts and i think these last couple of drafts have been very good for the ducks but there have been aspects of the arizona coyotes that we felt the ducks were almost building towards right that the ducks didn't necessarily have this high-end talent and they could end up like arizona just you know right in the middle there now i think maybe that's changed a little more maybe their upside is a little bit better now especially with zegers performing the way he is um pro drysdale things like that but um, it, it, it's one of those things where I feel like Arizona is definitely a cautionary tale for where they're at right now. That mm-hmm. being said, you do have San Jose, and I think San Jose and Anaheim, to me, are about the same. And I feel like, as you said, Felix, I don't necessarily think the Ducks should be expected to beat San Jose. I think it is sort of a toss-up. But keep in mind, there's trajectories here, whereas the Ducks are a little bit more of an upward trajectory. Mm-hmm. San Jose is definitely on a downward trajectory. Like, their oh, yeah. farm system is completely <laughs> yeah. they, buried. They, still have, they still have further to slide before they hit rock bottom. They, like, they yeah. haven't hit rock bottom yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> and the Kings are, like, now on their way up. They're a little bit further behind of the Ducks, but they've got some incredible talent who's very yeah. young yeah. who's going to be making an impact here. So, uh, a lot of it is just you can't just look at the placement. You need to look at the trajectory. And I feel like as of right now, you know, the Ducks are kind of where maybe we expected them to be. We'll see what happens moving forward. And this, uh, the last couple of games were a good result. But um, I think that given where the standings are at right now, probably won't be too far off from what we see at the end of the season. Well, what's interesting for the Ducks in this season, and this is something that I was thinking about watching the, the San Jose games, was that how much different would our perception of this team be and even the franchise as a whole if they had started off playing the Kings and the Sharks and, you know, these kind of lower tier teams as opposed to just a steady diet of Vegas, Minnesota, Colorado to start this season. I mean, for you, do you think, I mean, for either of you really, I mean, whoever wants to jump in here, do you think that that would change things? Would that have been a better way to start or does it just not really matter at all? I think if you are trying to set up the team to kind of jump into the season, I think you would have preferred to have a little bit of a, a couple softballs to start the year as compared to being thrown thrown into the, the fire of it all with, with Vegas and, and Colorado. But I, I think it wouldn't have really changed my perception at all if we had swapped out the these results. If basically you took that 10-game stretch uh, at the start of the year, threw it, a couple games later and had a game against these game against the Kings and the Sharks happen before it. I really don't think in my perspective, it really would have changed anything. And to be honest, I probably would be feeling a little bit worse right now than I am. At Cause the you'd, you'd be coming off some bad losses and, as and it, and it would have, re- <laughs> and it would have reinforced the narrative to me that it was simply the, the Kings and the Sharks being poor uh, or being a poor team as compared to the Ducks actually having improved play. And that's where I think the, the key aspect here is um, where, where does this team go in this week? The games against Vegas are going to be key to see where they're key to seeing where this team goes, how it is going to be performing. If it is the lineup changes, if it's all these various different things that happened, or if it was just simply playing poor teams. And the, the interesting thing on the sharks, I I wanted to jump in on this when when talking about kind of comparisons and, and different things like that in terms of where they're at, it, just in terms of current roster construction, it's kind of funny when you compare the the Ducks and, and the Sharks as a whole because the Sharks, I think, undoubtedly, we would all agree, have better high-end talent in from the skater position, and where their downfall is is the goaltending. And it's just kind of funny because it's almost as if it's polar opposites between the two teams with the Ducks having John Gibson back there and Ryan Miller, a pretty stellar goaltending tandem as compared to Martin Jones and Devin Nubnik being the downfall for that Sharks team. And I would say the Sharks probably have the better talent up front as compared to the Ducks. And so it's just, it's a funny comparison in how big of a difference goaltending makes in terms of where your roster ends up being at that point in time. Because, I mean, as we talked about, the Ducks roster, if it didn't have John Gibson, would be significantly lower uh, for this season. So, um, 
And and it, your point too just kind of illustrates the whole saying of goaltending is the great equalizer, right? Yeah. Goaltending yeah. can really make or break a team. Yep. Show me a good coach, and I'll say show you a good goalie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I mean, what I would just say is that my so I I definitely agree that with the Sharks they have better roster talent right now, and so you know being able to be being able to beat them should actually be kind of seen i think in a bit of a higher from a, from a bit of a higher perspective than beating the kings who yes. are clearly kind of i think the kings have definitely gone more all in on their rebuild whereas the sharks are just now entering that kind of phase 1 they don't have the they don't have like a crown jewel prospect yet at all um and so my question would just be, you know, how much, how much, to, and before, I mean, we, we're, we're really, we should probably talk about these games at some point, but how much does it matter to you that, hey, oh, you know, you, you know, because for some people, they, you might see it as, hey, oh, you know, the Ducks beat the Kings, the Ducks beat the Sharks, you know, this is a, this is a good sign that, that, that maybe they're a little further along, that things are, are clicking more for, for the Ducks than they are for these other teams, that the rebuild is going better. Do you believe in that at all? I mean, because for me, just to kind of, <laughs> put my own thoughts out there before you guys jump in. I, I think that it doesn't totally matter because ultimately, like I was just saying, these both these teams, the other California teams are at drastically different points at their in, in their just kind of developmental paths. And it's the same thing for the Ducks as well. They th- th- This current Ducks team will probably not be the final version when the Ducks are on the other side of this retool. So... Anyway, how much does it matter to you th- these games? <laughs> not not a lot, um, honestly. I think that well, first off, like we talk about the recent narrative of the Ducks, and I think that's important to talk about as far as fan perception goes. But if you are trying to accurately get a, a an analysis on this hockey team, like if you're trying to put yourself into Bob Murray in the front office's shoes, right? Like what kind of happens over the ups and downs of the season aren't really, I think, going to matter a whole lot. What's going to matter is overall the expectations, where you're at, how you're playing as a whole through the entire group of games and what happens at the end of the season. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and that's really what's going to matter. And so these games, I don't necessarily think, let's put it this way. If you are a rational, logical hockey fan who wants the best for the Ducks and who wants them to be better and to improve upon than a wing against a bottom feeder like the Kings and taking three or four points against the San Jose Sharks, a team on the downswing, shouldn't any drastically, barely even marginally change your opinion of this team and where they're at, really. Um, And like Felix said, I think we're getting to that point now where we're near the you know, quote unquote, 20, you know, quarter point of the season. Um, And that at that point, you can start drawing some conclusions. And I think that it's pretty clear whether you're looking at eye test or analytics test that this team isn't necessarily a high flying, high achieving team. And I want to jump in here real quick on on kind of all that and kind of add if we're talking about long term kind of the rebuild being over are the ducks doing it better than other teams i think from that perspective no this doesn't really matter uh we we've talked about it ad nauseum on the show but there's a whole lot more the ducks could have been doing to to make this team better in the future as compared to prioritizing the now and so if you're looking at this from that perspective these wins don't really matter they matter i think from the perspective of bob murray who's trying to make the playoffs this year really <laughs> yeah. reinforcing that narrative they matter because these are the teams that you got to get points against and you got to be able to at least least tread water with because these are the teams you you should be doing it and so um the the difference or basically if we are trying to say does this matter for for the ducks rebuild or show that they're doing it better no because the ducks at least compared to the kings more so than the sharks the kings have sold off a lot of assets and essentially made their team worse um on the whole to get better in the long term, to really set up their team, to build their prospect system, to get draft picks, to get draft capital that you can eventually maybe trade to get someone that will help out your team in the now when you end up contending. Whereas the Ducks are set up and they have their current roster still. They haven't changed anything. So we knew this Ducks team as a result of that was probably going to be better than that the, the Kings as a whole. But the Ducks prospect system is good because the Ducks have basically just been bad, not on purpose. They, they've lucked their way and not lucked. But they they've gotten into these picks not on purpose. They they've tried to be good and been bad hey, in the they, process. They, they moved down in the lottery last draft, so unlucky. 
Yeah, exactly. Shame on, shame on you. Yeah, sorry, running. sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. But it, it's not as if Bob Murray's committed to this this idea. No. And so from that perspective, no. of, does this matter for long term? No, these games don't matter at all for that. The, this the, These <laughs> games don't impact how I'm going to feel in two years, three years where yeah. these teams are. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that we're absolutely going to break down these games in, in just a, a couple minutes here. But <clears throat> I did really want to... Str- I think it, we would be selling our listeners short if we didn't express these feelings because we're not going to sugarcoat it. The Ducks are a team that they want to make the playoffs. They've said that. And it is pretty obvious that their desire to make the playoffs doesn't seem to line up with the reality of their team, whether it's roster construction or coaching ability. Either way, it doesn't seem to match up. Um, so, yeah, from the viewpoint of what the franchise wants, then, yeah, these games 100% matter. But like you were just saying, Jake, and and CJ as well, just the long-term trajectory of this team, these games, these types of wins are not the most meaningful. We can still take some things away from them, individual performances, uh, certain trends, but it's not quite the same as beating a uh, Vegas Golden Knights team. So we're not trying to dismiss the Ducks' wins. They, They... they, they found a way to win two out of three this week and get points in all three games. But we're looking at this team less so from just the the, the chase for the fourth spot in, in the in the division to more of just, hey, what is going to be the most impactful thing long term for this franchise? So with all of that being and said, I think it's really just I, I think just really quick, it's important to, to, to mention that. You know, you think about the players, too, and being in a winning versus losing environment. And I think that it, it almost sounds like you've got these players who just want to win. It's bred into them. It's born and bred that they want to compete. They want to win. Um, but really what we're looking for is that at this point, and like Jake said, the wins don't necessarily matter to us right now. What I want to see, and I, what I think all of us want to see, is that even if they're losing games, we still want to see them play fun hockey. We want to see them have good fundamentals. We want to see them, um, you know, put together good games from underlying numbers, from you know, eye test, from from effort, and from all of that stuff. And if they lose, then so what? The record isn't necessarily going to matter that much as far as the future goes. Um, and so I think that, like for instance instance the the friday game against san jose sharks let's be real that was not a good hockey game from either team bad goaltending bad defense um all over the place but it was fun as hell there was offensive explosions there were definitely some good you know offensive systems in my opinion that were going on and if every ducks loss was like that i think i would be perfectly content and i feel like that would probably be better for the morale in the room um so the way you do play i think definitely does matter it's just you need to be looking at the systems and the actual players and the play on the ice rather than the standings column yeah, 100%. So we have about, let's see here, we have about 10 minutes before we have to take a quick break. So let's just quickly go over this. Um, or let's use that 10 minutes to go over the game that we saw against the Los Angeles Kings in L.A. So the Ducks won that game 3-1. to one. Kings dealing with some injuries, but the Ducks dealing with some injuries as well. No Derek Grant in that game. No Max Jones, which we would find out was actually... Um, an injury and not a healthy scratch and so the Ducks really dominated in this one I mean if you look just at the the shot metrics the scoring chances at five on five per natural stat trick 38 to 11 Anaheim high danger chances 18 to 5 expected goals 3.6 4 to 1.28 so they basically annihilated the Kings. It didn't it didn't necessarily feel that way just on the scoreboard, but if you were watching the run of play, you could see that the Ducks were clearly in control of this game. So what did you guys kind of take away from this one overall? Um so real quick should note going into this game, Adam and Reek drew back into the game after he was healthy scratched in the second game against the the Blues. Um, and so he drew back in of note on the wing, which I think came at a shock to all of us. And Isaac Lundestrom drew in, um, at center. I, he played 10 minutes between Ricard Raquel and Max Comtois. My overall takeaways from this game were the Ducks got a bunch of good looks. It was somewhat concerning that they weren't able to score more, 
but I guess we we can't really complain when they actually generated a bunch of offense. 3.64 expected goals for at five on five, uh, 4.61 in all situations. Um, I believe that prior to that game, the Ducks high in expected goals was underneath three. And so obviously I think that you have to look at the positives of they generated more chances in that game than they had the rest of the season, uh, basically. And the only downside is they didn't really have the skill level to finish it. And that's also something we've talked about. The Ducks team, the high level skill isn't necessarily there. Um, but I think overall the, the Ducks were, uh, the Ducks were basically pushing the play, playing how they should, playing like you would expect them to do against uh, a subpar Kings team. And really, the biggest thing of note to me from from this game isn't necessarily a Ducks relate Ducks note. It's how bad Drew Doughty looked. It was <laughs> I, I I don't think I had watched a Kings game really in a while, and it was noticeable how slow, how behind the pace, how just bad Drew Doughty had become. And I believe there's yeah, but, six years yeah, left but, on that yeah, contract. But what do you- what do you know, Jake? You're you're in the media. You're not one of uh, his teammates. He, yeah. he doesn't hear that from his teammates. <laughs> yeah, but that contract is going to absolutely like we we give the Kings a lot of credit for how they've managed their rebuild and how they've done well, things. They're with... they're writing a lot of wrongs. There there there's still a lot yeah. to undo there. That there are Game let me party. there are six six years left after this one at eleven million on that deal. And, oh. and by the way, for, for those who didn't get my little fake job at Jake there, it's it's from Drew Doughty responding to criticism <laughs> about being left off of Team Canada or possibly being left off of Team Canada. Um, CJ, would you agree, though, that the biggest highlight of this game was Max Contois trying the Michigan move from behind the net? I mean, that to oh, me, that's, yeah. the biggest, that's the biggest takeaway from this <laughs> game, if we're being honest. I love it. No, I mean, it, I, I want to see much more of that. You know, people who have listened to you two and me when I get on, um, you know, we all just love fun hockey. We want more fun things to happen. Um, and I just, I, I also have to say that come to while trying to pull off the Michigan move. And then of course, Doughty had to come in and yeah. like give him a, what a cross check and try and talk to him. Like he gave Doughty him a is the perfect to the body. Yeah. <laughs> Dowdy's the perfect example of the, no, you're not allowed to have fun in hockey. Just kind of come up and, and, and do your business. Right. Um, and it, it just, I, I don't think it's definitely endearing him at all to the Ducks fans. Not that he was endeared at all to Ducks fans in the first place, but um, I think that just made him the extra villain. And it, the thing that does rub me the wrong way though, with that is that, Dowdy seems to have, and and at least publicly, he seems to have a, a healthy amount of cognitive dissonance between what his team is, where his play is, and, uh, you know, kind of what's happening out there on the ice, right? Um, yeah. And so just seeing that, not great, but I do kind of like it at the same time because it adds fuel to the fire. It adds more fire to the rivalry. A fiery Kings-Ducks rivalry, I think, is great for hockey and great for Southern California hockey. Um, but I-, I would love to see more of that. And we kind of did see some of that when Zegras almost tried to pull off a Michigan in the, in the, in the San Diego game as well. So some fun stuff. I want to see all of it. Yes. Well, so, I mean, to me, the other big takeaways from this game, I mean, there there's kind of the... There's the more mainstream take, which is, you know, Nick Delorier, Gordy Howe hat trick opens the game with a totally spontaneous fight, you know, you know, j- just heat of the moment type fight. Uh, not, not at all pre-planned, uh, of course, with Curtis McDermott. Uh, and then he picks up an empty netter and also had an assist on the Davis David Backus goal, which was the second goal of the night for the Ducks. And that to me is the other storyline is that outside of Nick Delorier is that David Backus Look, despite it being the Kings, David Backus hasn't played a ton of hockey in the last year. Um, you know, he, he, when he got traded to Anaheim, he, he he barely played, and he wasn't really playing much before that. He was down in the AHL. So David Backus looked really good against L.A., scored a goal, was driving play, was making passes, and that's something that we had been seeing from him. And I think now, um, you know, even with Derek Grant back in the lineup, the Ducks were dealing with other injuries. Um so he got to stay in, but I just think that we're we're at the point where David Backus has to be in a mainstay in this lineup. Yeah, one hundred percent. The fourth line looks so much better. The fourth line looks yeah. so much better with with him there as compared to Derek Grant. And and, and yeah. the numbers have and now granted we should give yes. we, we yeah should, you can't have it both ways. I know <laughs> he this has been primarily against bad teams, 
But mm-hmm. even against the Blues, they looked better with, with yes. David Backus there. And I think that that's a key thing is once they put David Backus there, they looked a fair amount better. Um, and um, he just brings a, a calm element. He He's just so much better than Derek Grant in his own zone. You you well, lose maybe the, the thing that Derek Grant does well, and I think we should give him credit for this, and it's one thing that um, – I I think he's poor everywhere else, but he's opportunistic with his chances. <laughs> he's able to pot his chances when he gets them, and I he think that's a something. Bit more of a touch, but, and, but he's yeah. he's not good in his own zone, and I think that's one of the things that David Backus does. I mean, CJ's one of the biggest Backus proponents I know. Someone that was pushing for him to be in this lineup uh, ever since they traded for him, and uh, I mean, he just steadies out that fourth line so much. Well, I think there's a, yeah, there's and a... I wrote about this. Yeah, go ahead, CJ. No, go I was just going to say, like, I wrote about this for Anaheim Calling um, a while back where I took a look into his numbers. And here's the thing. David Backus, even with Boston, was never bad. He was always a good player. The issue was is that he signed that big contract extension and he just he, he wasn't as good offensively. Um, David Backus has always been a two-way player. Like, David Backus... Uh, prime David Backus and prime Ryan Kessler were like almost the same player, basically. Um, uh, that hard edge, really good two way game who could chip in goals, 50 points, you know, 60 point upside. Um, and and so they were basically the same player. And the offense dropped off for David Backus, but the defensive play never stopped. He was always great defensively for Boston. He was great in the room, very popular. I remember when Backus was traded over here, there were a ton of Boston fans that I saw on social media who were. Like, look, I'm sad to see him go. You know, it's for the best and we get it. But he was, you know, he was a, an addition to the team. He just wasn't necessarily worth the contract. And so I feel like at this point in his career, David Backus is exactly who you want out of a bottom six, preferably fourth line center, a guy who's going to drive play. He's the type of guy that we talk about when you want a fourth liner, not these guys who get caved in on shot attempts like Derek Grant and Nick Delorier and stuff like that. We're talking about a guy who can drive play the other way. They're not going to necessarily get you 30 40 50 points every season but they're going to create the energy they're going to give your guys a rest and you can throw them out there and not have to be on edge that they're going to get scored on every single time they get on the ice that's exactly what david backus brings and as long as you expect that from him and no more um that's what a lot of teams need that's what the ducks need and i think that you'll be pleasantly surprised with david backus and we've seen that lately from him yeah absolutely and i think that the big difference to me with David Back is because, you know, someone might be wondering, well, how how are they different or how are they um, how is one perhaps more effective than the other? And I think with Derek Grant, he really relies on getting rush opportunities. You know, he kind of floats out. He's kind of just hanging out in the middle of the ice in the defensive zone, waiting for a turnover, waiting to just kind of spring himself moving forward. And then from there, that's where he does his damage, whereas you know, David Backus is a lot more active. He's a lot more, you know, he, I don't want to say that he chases pucks, but he does more than just kind of stay in his own section, his own zone of the, of, of their defensive third. And then going the other way, he's a lot better along the boards. He's a lot better just working the puck down low. He's looking for teammates. He's just more like, you know, in, I guess it's to use a basketball term, he's more of a half court player as opposed to like a transition player. He, and, and I think that that translates a little better for and when it comes to, you know, the shot metrics, it, it, it translates a little better as opposed to a guy who's just going to kind of pick and choose his opportunities. And I mean, credit to Derek Grant, he's done that very well and it's gotten him paid, but I think David Backus's style contributes just a bit more to winning. Yep. Okay. A- oh. Any um, any final thoughts on this LA game before we uh, take a quick break here? We haven't really talked about it too much, but the the defense looked a lot more solid in this game. And now, granted, part of that is playing an LA yeah. team where the LA could barely uh, make passes in the neutral zone without fumbling it to the Ducks' defense in, in the process. It was painful to watch the Kings try to transition the puck through the neutral zone, which obviously helps out your defense a lot when they just basically give you the puck. But credit where it's due with this defense, they they really uh, they played a solid game. We saw basically Kevin Shattenkirk and Hampus Lindholm have a really, really good game, which was necessary for them. Cam Fowler, Yanni Hockenpah also looked really solid. Um, so it, it's one of those things where quality of competition was poor, but give them credit, like we've been saying, that they took advantage of that. The defense looked really good. I mean, this 
this defense, let me see right now, they were all in the 78 plus range in terms of expected goals for percentage, which is pretty good. None of them allowed over one expected goal against, uh, and then the Lindholm Shattenkirk pairing was on the ice for 1.74 expected goals for, for Shattenkirk 1.53 for uh, Fowler. So, or not Fowler for Lindholm. So um, the, that pairing of Lindholm Shattenkirk really showed up for that game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is interesting just to kind of touch on the Shattenkirk pairing where their numbers this season are actually pretty decent. They're, they're still above break even. They're about 52% in terms of shot attempts and about 51 in terms of expected goals. That may be a little different after last night, but you might say, well, you know, their stats got padded by the LA game, but they've also had some really bad games where they've been caved in. So it kind of evens out. Mm-hmm. They've, had, they've had tough matchups also. They, they've been basically yeah. matched up. And well, so they, it evens out over time. And that's why you want a sample size. Yeah. They've been thrown to the wolves a bit. And I do think that those two together, even though they take a lot of penalties and, you know, Shattenkirk has had his blunders, which we've documented, which we've seen. They're they're making it work. And I think that the more time goes on, I I I think you shouldn't be writing off that pairing yet. Cause I'm I'm sensing a contingent of Ducks fans on Twitter kind of you know, there's a lot of anxiety around that that Shattenkirk I mean, contract and the way he's playing. He's he's past well, thirty and it's a three year deal. It, it it's somewhat concerning. Well, and, and I'm glad that you kind of brought this up, too, because before we started this pod, I actually looked at the uh, um, the wrap from the RAPM for uh, Shattenkirk and for Lindholm um, from Evolving Hockey. Many of you are familiar with this. If you're not, it's those you know bar graphs that you see um, that happen all the time that kind of quantify isolated production in a multitude of categories. And so I was looking. Kevin Shattenkirk actually has pretty good offensive numbers. He's a little bit below on goals four per 60 on actual production, which makes sense. But he's got good numbers uh, on the expected goals for and the Corsi for. And remember, this is isolated production isolated from his partner Hampus Lindholm now I looked at Hampus as well um, and so just for reference here to Shattenkirk definitely as you might expect does not have good defensive numbers his expected goals allowed per 60 and course he allowed per 60 definitely on the lower side of things whereas if you look at Hampus's graph um, he's pretty he's great across the board like he's having a fantastic season um, but that being said I don't necessarily buy the argument that Lindholm is completely carrying Shattenkirk. Like, yes, Lindholm, I think, is definitely the better of those two and has been the better player. But Shattenkirk, at least offensively, has actually been pretty good and pretty productive, in my opinion. It's just when you have those glaring mistakes like he does, those can sometimes, you know, as far as eye test goes, um, outweigh some of the smaller things that you see him do on the ice. Um, So I think that so far that pair certainly is far from perfect, but they're the best defensive pairing that the Ducks have right now. Yeah. And we've uh, lost Felix for, for some reason. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. We'll get him back real quick, but while Felix is gone, let's uh, let's have a little word from our sponsor. So Valentine's day, Valentine's day is upon us, fellas. Make sure you're ready for wherever the night may take you. Our friends at Manscaped, the global leader in men's below-the-waist grooming, are here to tell you that you need the best tools for the job so you can be ready for anything on that special day. Um, Two million men are already trusting Manscaped products to groom. Make sure you're one of them. Um, Your girl can't think of what to get you this year? Tell her there's a perfect gift for you. Uh, For you and for her. The best way to get started is the Manscaped Perfect Package 3.0. And CJ, you, we, we've, all, we've gotten our perfect package 3.0. What, what have you thought about it so far? Oh, it's been great. I, uh, I put a, um, uh, I still have a little bit of the uh, ball deodorant left over. Um, so I'm still using that at home. So I brought some over and I left it at my girlfriend's house. And uh, just know that um, she says that this is gross. I have to see this in that. But you know what? I think she does appreciate it. So take it from me um who has used this it's it's been fantastic and i and i was actually surprised i did not know that they were actually going to be sending a um refresh of this so that was definitely pleasantly surprising and i'm enjoying it very much 
Yeah, and so the Perfect Package 3.0, though, is led by the revolutionary third-generation Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer, which has advanced skin-safe technology and features a cutting-edge cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. It's also waterproof, which prevents uh, a mess on the bathroom floor and in the sink, especially when it's time for Cupid to shoot his arrow. And let's be real. We've all smelled uh, worse down there. That's why the Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver are great products. They smell good. Uh, their manly scent is attractive and will help set the mood, if you know what I mean. Um, and you also, with the Perfect Package 3.0, by the way, get the uh, Manscaped Boxers, which will keep you fresh all day long. Basically, this is the perfect package for you. Uh, get 20% off plus free shipping when you use the code CTP at manscaped.com. And so, once again, get 20% off and free shipping with code CTP at, tw- uh, CTP at manscaped.com. And happy Valentine's Day from Manscaped. So, uh, looking at trying to get Felix back here. But while we do that... Uh, I'm here. See- oh, you are here. Uh, we yes. do not have your video. If, Crap, uh... he's back. Everybody stop shit-talking him. Oh, <laughs> and, and there he is. I'm and here. CJ and Felix have swapped squares for anyone watching the video. So, ha- <laughs> <laughs> the ad read's done. You missed out on all the fun, Felix. Oh, I heard. I heard you. Hey, at look, the end there. I'm number one on the podium now. <laughs> look at yeah. look at me. I am the captain now. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. I have no clue what's going on here, but we will fight on. We will fight on, Jake. Hope you hope you like that. Um, okay. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about these games against the Sharks. So. The Ducks dropped their game uh, Friday night in the shootout to the Sharks five to four. I want to have like this kind of overarching takeaway. I want to have this, you know, fast and ready take on this game, but I kind of don't. This game was just all over the place. You know, the Ducks at one point had a, a, a pretty sizable lead. They were, I think, up three one, and then they blew that, and then it went to the shootout. I don't know. What did you guys? take away from this or, or what were some of the things that that stood out to you in this game do you, i mean do you really have to ask me you don't you you guys don't know what what the answer is you, you guys were it. it, it's the fact that hashtag Minus. troy terry is very good obviously um <laughs> so this was the game actually where ryan gets off this is the first one he was out and they put Derek grant on the first line which was very baffling turned out wasn't awful and i think a large reason of that was for whatever reason maybe it's the way the sharks were playing them who knows Troy Terry, it seemed like he flipped a switch in this game that he kind of let happen or kept going with in the second game. But it seemed like him and Adam and Reek had some good chemistry and they yep. were able to use that to, to create chances. Derek Grant was able to kind of pitch in a little bit there. I don't know if I'm necessarily uh, a big believer in the fact that Derek Grant was a, a driver there as compared to Terry and Henrique more so doing the driving and Grant being along for the ride. But Troy Terry looked insanely good in this game. You look at the goal that he scored where he cut across the middle, and that's what we kind of saw from him in the AHL when he's at his most confident. Uh, He's able to get the puck on net that ends up creating the Adam Henrique, or I think the first shot creates the Adam Henrique goal. And we saw it in overtime how he... One of the big issues for this Ducks team in three on three overtime over the essentially the history of three on three overtime is, is that they don't really have the players that can take on guys one on one and create chances necessarily. The Ducks are a team that are built on grinding it on. That just doesn't necessarily work in three on three. Troy Terry, one of the reasons why I've always been so excited by him is he's a very different breed of player. He's more of the modern type of player that can play in transition, play with speed, play with some skill. And he showed that in overtime and almost finished it on his own with the chance and set up Cam Fowler for a glorious chance to be able to finish it. So if you wanted to come away with one takeaway from this game is that Troy Terry looked really good. And if you're a Ducks fan, this is important. One of the big things for Bob Murray, if you want to believe his win now mode, one of the big things for that is the Troy Terry's and Max Comtois need to take a step and start producing this year to be able to push them because that is not what they have done to start the year. Even though Comtois had those two goals against Vegas outside of that, he's been real quiet um, or three goals against Vegas. He, He was real quiet before this series. And so those guys have to produce. They, they have to, if this team wants to have a chance. And, And so they did in this game and the ducks ended up getting to, to shoot out and they lost in the shootout, but they were competitive and they got points. I think the thing that we saw specifically from Troy Terry, at least what I noticed was the fact that he seemed to be trying to just 
get the puck on net in whatever way he could. And wow, what a shocker. This is why we love Corsi so much is that like, look, you get shots on net and good things happen. And I think that what we've seen from Troy Terry a lot, and one of the reasons why he hasn't taken that next step forward yet, is that he, I feel like he tries to overthink things on the ice too. He's trying to get the perfect lane. He's trying to get the perfect read in. Um, And we all know that he's capable of letting the puck fly. Like, you know, that seven point in two games or whatever, that insane run that he went on like two seasons ago when he got, you know, called up and then back down and everything like that again, he was you know, flinging the puck on net. And we saw that these last couple of games as well. And we especially saw that in that first San Jose game where he just kept putting puck after puck on net wherever he could. And we saw that really start to pay off. And and he looks so much more dangerous when he does that. He's got a good shot. We've seen it. I don't think it's necessarily like an elite world beater shot, but he's got a shot that can beat goalies. And if he uses it, more of those points in production are going to come. And so I'm really glad that we did see at least the flash of that this weekend, and especially in that game on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean that, that to me is probably the biggest takeaway from the Friday night game is that the Ducks' younger players were driving the bus. I mean, Troy Terry with the nicest goal of his career in the NHL. Is that fair to say? I, I don't. Yeah, think he... I would say so. I don't think he scored a prettier goal cutting to the middle and then going top shelf and then Max Contois scoring two goals in almost identical fashion. So, you know, I mean that that is going to be like, like Jake was saying, it's really important for the ducks. If they want to have any chance this season to make the playoffs, they need the kids the you know, the younger players to be more than just, hey, it's nice that you were driving play tonight, or it's nice that you were suppressing chances on your end. They need guys to actually produce, and maybe that's a little bit of an unfair expectation. Who knows? Um, I would argue it's probably not unfair at this point because they're essentially entering their primes. I mean, they're all about 22. So that's really encouraging. If and it, I mean, and it, on that same night, I think Trevor Zegras had a goal and two assists, in, in the AHL. So that was a really promising night for the Ducks future, despite the loss, despite the shootout loss. I think that there's some good that you can take away from that night for sure. Even though that they couldn't get it done in the shootout. Anything else you guys want to add on this game? Um, I don't know if there's really anything else to add. I mean, it was good to see the Ducks get chances. They were able to pot it. This was the game where, if you're looking at five on five, the Ducks controlled play at 55% expected goals, four percentage. If you're looking at all all situations, they also generated more chances, 3.31. So uh, good on, good for the Ducks. Where on the whole, at five or in all situations, they were struggling to really create chances. Where let me just quickly look here. It looks like outside of. Those two games, sorry, the the game against the Kings, they generated 4.61 actually in all situations. So obviously a a season high there, but the the game against the Sharks, 3.31 in all situations, that's uh, on par with the game against the Avalanche where they looked really, really good. Um, So overall, good on them for for creating chances, granted against a bad team, but good on them for that. Um, John Gibson didn't have his best game in the third period, um, and I think maybe that's a bit of a concerning sign. I, he mean, I mean, he hasn't been that good lately. Basically, the, since the since the three goals against St. Louis. Yeah, he like it's almost yeah. as if he got pissed and then his his play hasn't really rebounded necessarily since then. Yeah, that that's a pretty concerning sign. If you're the Ducks, they're still managing to get points. They're still managing to get by, but it'll be interesting to see once the competition starts to ramp back up the, a bit. The, what what kind of goaltending they're going to get. The Vegas series is going to be very telling on that. If if John Gibson is mediocre like he was against the Sharks against Vegas, the Ducks are probably going to get punished a lot. And so it's going to be critical to see if he can bounce back and have better games. Well, what's concerning to me about Gibson is that if he is like if he's going to continue to struggle or, or you know, I don't think he's been bad, but he just hasn't been a, a really a difference maker. If he continues on that that trajectory and let's say for a few more weeks and then maybe has a hot streak here and there, but his season on the balance doesn't look that great. That would then pretty much be two years in a row of him not being that awesome. So it's, it's still a bit premature, but 
I'm just I, he has to turn it around at some point, right? It seems that with him, there's almost no in between. He's either superhuman or kind of just leaving you wanting a little bit more. And this is not something I was expecting to be saying uh, after the way he started the season. Um, looking at the second game, though, with Ryan Miller net, so not John Gibson. This was a much different game, uh, you know, not back and forth. You didn't see all the goals. You didn't see all the lead changes. Um, I mean, this game ended 2-1 to one in the shootout. And really, the story of this game, I think most people would agree, is that Isaac Lundestrom, is it, I think it's Lundestrom. I think we're, we're getting there on that. Lundestrom uh, had his first NHL goal. Now, granted, he was trying to jump out of the way of a Hampus Lindholm shot and it went off of his stick and in, but he had a decent game. I mean, he was controlling down low. He was making some, some plays for his line mates um, and he gets rewarded for it, for that goal. So with, with that goal. So is, you know, how, how encouraged are either of you by that about the, the way that he's looked lately, both in the NHL and also in the AHL? uh cj you want to go first on this one <laughs> telling uh I, no you go ah uh, fine you go fine um <laughs> I, I mean like like we said about the ducks i don't know how much you can really buy into it. i mean good good for him to to have success i mean obviously the goal i don't really know he was in a good place and that that you go to you go to the right spots you end up scoring goals and, and so that's kind of what happened but it's not necessarily a skilled play um, that's kind of, if we were to peg a goal for Isaac Lundestrom, that would be the way I would expect it to be scored. It kind of bounces off of him and goes in. Uh, it obviously is a skilled, it's a play where you have to be in the right place at the right time, but it's not necessarily indicative of having a really high skill level. And that's kind of Isaac Lundestrom's play. He's known for being good positionally, very sound in that aspect. We're not having necessarily the highest skill level uh, on him. And that's what we've seen in various different aspects. And I mean, he looked good. He looked okay to good fine. when no when he played for the goals uh, against the oh, rain he, yes. he he scored the ot winner but and scored another goal in that game but um i don't know if he really stood out for me necessarily in that and so i i think he's looked better since the the first series against vegas but i don't know if this necessarily changes my my long-term outlook on isaac lindstrom i think that my view of him is he still probably long-term projects to be uh, a third liner at best, maybe a fourth line center in the modern day NHL is where he ends up. And not to really take this too far to the side, I just don't understand why he's on this roster as compared to Trevor Zegras uh, on the whole. It, it just, yeah. the, no, but like, to be honest, like, think about it. Th this, and Felix, you and I were texting us about this a little bit last night, but the, the fact that. Trevor Zegers is only a year younger than Isaac Lundersham. So it's not as if you can say there's this big development difference between the two of them. It's, it's a single year between the two of them. And you look at what they've done. Trevor Zegers is currently at, I think he, what is he at now? Five points in two games in the AHL so far this year. And he's like getting like, it's, it's insane how much closer he is to kind of where I, or, how much better he is in the AHL than Isaac Lindstrom has ever looked at that level, even in the preseason games this year. And so it, it's just crazy to me, the double standard that's happening within the organization between an Isaac Lindstrom and a Trevor Zegras. And it's hard from, it, it's, have, it's hard for me not to make this comparison. And I hey, know, don't for, don't forget Jake, Trevor Zegras has to show that he's better than someone on the ducks roster. Yeah. And he's, he's got five, to do that. five points in two AHL games, six points in four AHL preseason games. What was it 17 points in however many games in, in the world juniors? I this, this guy, this, in, I think it's, it's currently at, I think 27 points in 12 games. If we're including world juniors and preseason games, like th this guy has just been on fire scoring goals. If you want a guy to come in and produce and if you're trying to make the playoffs, I just have no idea why Trevor Zegers isn't being given a shot. It doesn't make any sense to me. And okay. well, th this just went off the rails. It did we're, go off the rails. Talking about the first game. So um, getting back to getting back to it, yes. Isaac Lundstrom looked fine. He didn't blow my socks well, off. He's their, fine. Their line, I mean, his line that night. I mean, they they did have very good numbers. If you look at their night on the whole, um, I mean. <laughs> They had a 78.95 Corsi 4 percentage. So Contois, Lindstrom, and Raquel Agreed. Did, did a really good job of generating offense. So here's my thing on that. Um, you know, whereas you may just completely go into a Zegers rant. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm wanting to is do. Not, which is not unwarranted. But to stick more on the Lindstrom thing, 
I will say that this is the first game where he's just looked like a first round pick. Um, the, you know, the, the entire season when he's played in the NHL, I'm not talking about the AHL, he's just been kind of invisible. He, he's been, uh, you know, I mean, he, he, he is not like a lack of effort. It's just he gets the puck on his stick. The play tends to die. He tries to make these moves one on one that don't really work. And so this was the first game where it felt like, OK, you, you see the first round potential a bit more. Um, so, you know, where I see other people saying, oh, you know, this is a, a great sign for Isaac Lindstrom. This is, you know, we're, we're seeing some legitimate progress. Sure. I mean, maybe it's progress, but I just think this should kind of just be more of like the baseline. Right. And, and you know, the, the development path for a pick in the 20s is going to be rocky. It's not always going to be just upward trajectory. But I I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm in the same vein that you guys have been saying, I'm just not quite as blown away by the fact that he got a goal and just his line was not caved in huh, on a given night. It, it, it doesn't I'm, stick out to me that much. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, blown away or anything like that. I think that Isaac Lundestrom to me is a guy who I'm fully expecting to basically be kind of top out as a fourth line center or a guy who could fill in higher up in the lineup with good line mates. I don't ever I don't necessarily believe that he outside of the fourth line he's ever going to drive a line on his own. I think it's pretty clear that you know when you have Raquel and you have somebody who shoots so much like Comtois, you know the, the, those guys I think are definitely going to I don't want to say carry you, but they're definitely going to, I think, make you look a little bit better than you actually are. And he could be a good complimentary and supporting piece to that. Um, but I-, I will say that having Isaac Lundestrom as a regular NHLer, even on a fourth line, is a fine outcome for a 20s pick. Yeah. Right? Like, there's mm-hmm. so many, we see so many late first round picks who never make the NHL or who burn out or anything like that. And I think that Lundestrom is, and it's still early too, like, things things could change. Like you said, he's only a year older than um, Trevor Zegers. But based on what I've seen so far and some of the results that have come out, I do believe that he is the type of person that you can't give too many responsibilities to consistently. Um, I, I, I do believe that if you force him into higher roles, like a second or first line center, that's where you're going to get burned. But if you keep him down with the, the, the easier matchups, the, the fourth line, the energy, things like that, um, then I think he's got a chance to perform as expectation. And occasionally, maybe he'll be able to put together a good game filling in on a higher line for you. Yeah, I mean, that would probably be the best case scenario. I know people who are extremely high on Isaac Lindstrom and, uh, you know, <laughs> good, great. Uh, we'll see. I <laughs> uh, want to give a shout out real quick to our good friend George, who just uh, gifted five subs uh, out in the Twitch chat. So I nice. want to give a shout out. Thank you, George, so much. Good friend of the show. Uh, so yeah, uh, if anyone else wants to do that, obviously, uh, gifting out subs is a a great way to help the show. Obviously it's, uh, it's being kind and giving out, uh, subscriptions to other people. Yeah. So just to round out, uh, the recap for the final sharks game before we probably dive into some questions here. Um, the ducks in the shootout, Troy Terry, really nice shootout goal, uh, went forehand backhand and then, uh, Max Contois went five hole. And overall in this game, Ryan Miller looks solid, which I think is probably a good development uh, or not a development, but a, a good sign for the Ducks, because I don't think Ryan Miller looked that great in the stint that he got in relief for John Gibson last week. So I think it's good to see him kind of put together a nice, complete game. Uh, some people were really confused to see Kevin Shattenkirk in the shootout. Um, he's 14 for 36, well, I guess 14 for 37 now in his career which isn't a bad percentage at all, especially for a D-man. And so I I didn't have any particular issues with that. What's now, somewhat somewhat confusing on that is the Ducks have Jacob Silverberg still and, and did yeah. not have him shoot, and you could have had him go in comparison to Kevin Shattenkirk to ice the shootout. So just, yeah. just wanted to put that out there. One, yeah, no, and I think that's fair. Um, one thing I did want to say, though, just to round out our view of these games, is that... You know, as much as, um, you know, some of the kids on this team look great. And I, I do think that Max Contois, 
even though he's not a perfect player right now, and he's you know he's still I would say in the beginning of his uh, development curve, he's he's a, he's a guy who can score, right? We don't know yet to what mm-hmm. degree he'll be able to score it consistently, but he's got a knack for it. It tends to happen when he's when he's out there, right? Um, so he's got that. Um, I think with Troy Terry, even though there's been some frustration about his consistency or or his effectiveness, I do think that it's pretty clear that when he's going, he's a great distributor of the puck, that he can also shoot the puck when, when he's uh, really feeling it. And so there's at least some kind of uh, attribute that you can identify with him. The guy that I am still waiting on is Sam Steele, because we... We talked a lot about him in the beginning of the year and how he looked really good against Vegas. But since that time, I mean, it almost every, you know, whatever line he's on tends to get destroyed, you know, in terms of shot attempts. And that was no different uh, against San Jose. So even though they weren't, you know, their shot attempts were not that terrible in terms of the disparity, 20.26 20.26 expected goals for percentage for the Steele, Heinen, Silverberg line. And Heinen and Silverberg are two of the team's best five on five players. So for them to get caved in that badly, um, I don't think it's about the wingers. And so, look, I, I, I still think there's a path for Sam Steele to be an effective NHL player. No doubt about that. But the ceiling to me just, it's starting like all of the things that we said in the off season about him and breaking down different guys, uh, possible outcomes. I feel like what my skepticism back then is kind of coming back and it, it feels more validated by what we've seen since the very beginning of the season. And, um, I don't know, his ceiling kind of just keeps going down for me. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe I'm overreacting, but someone talked me out of it. No, I, I honestly, I'm not going to talk you out of that. I agree with you and that I'm, I'm not saying that I'm getting close to giving up on him by any stretch of the imagination. The The frustrating thing about Seal is that we've seen him with like these little small flashes of looking like, you know, incredibly skilled NHL player. Like we saw that when he first got called up, um, you know, near the end of the that, that season, a couple of seasons ago, and he went on a tear and then he's had like moments. And like you said, he looked good against Vegas and, and he, we know it's there. It's just, it's so frustrating because you saw what he did in junior. He put together such a great junior career And now you look at him here and, you know, he was one of those guys that I feel like was at one point probably could have been considered the Ducks top prospect. Um, And we're just not seeing any of that from him. And I wanted, like, I personally made it a vow to, to really kind of keep a close eye on him the next couple games because I haven't paid a ton of attention to him, but I really want to this time because something is up and something clearly isn't clicking. And I'm there with you that the longer this goes on and the more games that he has like this, the, 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 the lower that ceiling creeps. And I just, I I feel like there's so much more we could see from him. And so I really want to study and figure out like what exactly is happening with him. Yeah. It, it, to me, it's, it's defensive zone. His positioning is not fantastic. He leaves open some, some situations that, that really doesn't help with the breakout and uh, really allows him to get pinned in his own zone. And from an offensive perspective, the issue I see with him is he's, he's trying to make plays, but they're not really high percentage plays and they end up turning the puck over and end up going the other way. And as a center, he's getting caught deep in the process of that. And I, I think that that's really my big concern is that you're really seeing that come to fruition this season. And he didn't have good numbers last year either. He, anybody they played with, he kind of buried and, it, it was promising in the first game of the season to see him play so well with Comtois and Terry on his wings, but that line ended up eventually getting buried as it started going on more and more. And ever yeah, since they, then, they still, they still got buried despite their kind of good eye test moments. Yeah. The, yeah. The but numbers on the balance mm-hmm. were still bad. <laughs> they were okay in the first game. I think they were above 50% XGF in, in the first game, but after that they were completely on the negative side of it. And we've seen Terry have success since then. We've seen Comtois have success at five on five since then. We haven't yeah. seen, Seems, we haven't seen look great we haven't seen we haven't seen steel have any success outside of that really at five on five and i i think that that kind of validates our theory that it was steel really pulling that line down and we've seen that on a whole and it's kind of like this one thing where 
correlation doesn't always, what is it? Correlation doesn't always equal causation, but when you have enough of that correlation, you can start to draw some conclusions from it. And if we have all of these different players that end up playing poor when they're paired with, with Sam Steele, we can draw a conclusion that Sam Steele kind of pulls guys down a little bit. He's not, he's not, if anything, he's just not a positive. (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, here's some interesting quotes from Dallas Aikens earlier in the week, um, which I wanted to bring up here. Um, this is what he said to the media. I think this was on Friday. He said, Sam is still caught in that young player. I have to be nice and pass the puck to everybody mode. I just want him to shoot it in the net and don't worry about his teammates. We'll get him there saying, you know, we'll get him into that, that shoot first mode. Is that really what they should be looking to do with Sam Steele? You know, like what, where is this coming from that Sam Steele should be like a shooter type of player? I I don't want to see. Go ahead, CJ. I was going to say I want to see. I want to see the coaching staff talk to him about his vision because I feel like Sam Steele has had good vision in the past, and not just defensively. Like I think he, his vision now is kind of contributing. He's not reading plays very well in the defensive zone, leading to missed coverages. But at the same time, I feel like he's wasting a lot of that potential on the offense. It's almost kind of like the same things that before last season I critiqued Cam Fowler for, where Cam Fowler had this amazing transition game. He And, and I actually feel like Steele has a pretty good transition game. When he gets the puck on a stick through the neutral zone, I think that's where he's at his strongest. The problem is, is that like Cam Fowler's problem, with, for me, historically, has always been he would have this fantastic transition and then he would cross the blue line and then dump the puck and just like nothing would ever come with it and i'm almost seeing kind of a similar thing with sam steer well here he'll have a pretty decent transition he'll get through the neutral zone and then as soon as he crosses the line it's almost like his brain short circuits and he doesn't know what to do anymore and he either misses a pass he makes a poor play he goes for the low percentage play whatever that happens to be and I would really like to see Steele maybe get worked with the coaches on, you know, um, maybe some of that transition into the offensive zone play. Like, get him some one-on-one, you know, get him maybe some three-on-three drills. Get him to, like, survey his options because it just feels like he hasn't been making the best reads and the best outlets specifically on the offensive zone. And I think that, at least from my um, side of things, at least going back a couple of years now, that's something that I think he could really benefit from working on. And he doesn't necessarily, and like you said, Felix, he doesn't necessarily have to sit here and fling the puck up all the time. With him as a center, he could easily distribute it. I think he would be a better distributor than a shooter, um, but he needs to be able to make the right decisions and to read that play. Yeah, no, I, I think that with, with Sam Steele, he there's nothing wrong with him increasing his shot volume. I mean, it, it just hasn't been a strength sure. of it in his game. And so, yeah, sure. Get him to shoot more, but I guess this kind of notion that he's, I don't know. I, it was just kind of an odd quote, <laughs> but Dallas Aikens kind of give him credit. He says stuff that's just kind of, it seems pretty candid sometimes and it's a little off the wall. And so maybe we're reading too much into it. He also, he also said, and I think this is a hundred percent true that he said that the staff has been asking him to be harder on Pox, to just be more engaged defensively and on the forecheck. And I think that that's absolutely maybe the biggest weakness in his game, never yep. mind his tendency so, to, to not shoot or to try to be nice yeah. to everybody and get pass off. It's just that he's crummy defensively. And until that changes, we're not really going to have an opportunity to see um, his his offensive uh, tools flourish because he's just always stuck in his zone. And then by the time he gets out, um, he's, he's gassed. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that's going to need to change. Um, but I think it might be time to be transitioning to some questions. Yes. I would say. So Twitch chat, we'll get to you in a sec. I want to hit these first. We've got, uh, one in an email from Ken and then two from Twitter, then Twitch. It's all yours before we kind of end off the show with a, a fun little segment, uh, hashtag defend the nest. Um, so Ken started out with, Hey Jake, want to give you guys a great big thank you for your continual, uh, addition of analytics into your show. Really unique and insightful out there in ducks land. So thank you so much. That's really cut. We, what we kind of pride ourselves on trying to incorporate in, uh, analytics into our, uh, breakdowns and analysis of the team. That's kind of, I think what we're known for at this point, I would like to think, but here are the questions is Raquel unlucky or just past his prime. He's had lots of great chances with not much success. Ooh, well, 
I don't know. I haven't looked at Raquel's numbers quite as much as you two have, I think. I don't really think he's past his prime. I think he's within his prime currently. There will be ebbs and flows within that. I also think that he just... I mean, to be fair, to be honest, he just hasn't really been in the best environment. Like, the Ducks have not been a good offensive team, and Ricard Raquel is not really a guy who's going to drive offense individually. I think he's, a, as it turns out, a guy who maybe is a bit more dependent on his line mates than we may have uh, realized when he was having those those high-scoring seasons. So I think if you put Ricard Raquel in a better environment, I think this probably goes for a lot of guys in the Ducks. If you put them on a more... Uh, you know, a higher level team, they would do a lot better. And I mean, look at look at Kevin Shattenkirk and some of the struggles he's having this year compared to how well he did last year in Tampa Bay. So I'm not ready to write off Ricard Raquel. I just kind of think this is who he is. He's a support player. And if he doesn't have guys, great guys to kind of drive the bus for him, this is what he's going to look like. And by the way, just to kind of wrap that up, I, I think he's looked fine. Like I have no issues with how he's been playing. He's been one of the one of the Ducks forwards who seems to always have some kind of offensive moment in any given game. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with you, Felix. I think that Raquel, I've, I've been perfectly fine with Raquel's play this season. I don't think that we really should be expecting more of him. I think he's been perfectly fine. Um, good, even on a, a lot of situations, but look, there's a reason why Raquel's last 30 goal seasons came at Getzloff's last kind of prime elite years, right? We all know that Getzloff, while he's still a good player, isn't the elite force that he once was. He's no longer a top 10 center in the NHL. And I think that just kind of perfectly encapsulates how Raquel is that complementary player, where if he's going to, he has 30 goal potential. But he only has 30 goal potential if he has, uh, you know, a good enough line mates to get him there. And um, I think that he's a solid finisher, but he's not an elite finisher to the point where he can create that on his own. Um, he's a good player. He's the kind of complimentary player that everybody needs. He's probably even a first liner on uh, a lot of different teams. But again, as you said, Raquel is a guy who if you are expecting consistent 30 goal seasons out of him and him driving that way, without him having an elite center by his side, then you are going to be disappointed. And I think if you come to expect him as a guy who is maybe in the low 20 goal range um, and a guy who could put up, you know, 40, 50 points a year or something like that, maybe, you know, cross over into 60 with the right line mates, um, that is where he's going to meet his expectations. And that's a great player to have. Um, he's so far down the list of problems on this Ducks team for sure. Yep. Um, but I, I, I just, yeah, there's, there's and, nothing wrong with him in my opinion. I just think that those two 30 goal seasons kind of inflated his skewed, value a little skewed bit. The and perception. This is, yeah. They well, skewed the perception. And it, it's, it's funny because you look at mainstream media, specifically like the Ducks broadcast, everything's like that. They talk about all these different ways for him to regain the 30 goal form and, how, and how he's fallen off. And if you look at it, no, I mean, he, it, you can chalk it up to he played with Getzloff. You can chalk it up to the fact that he overshot what his percentages should have been. And in reality, well, he, he's, he also, he also played with Getzloff when he was still like yes. an absolute stud. And, and so if you look at individual yeah. expected goals, so what he's generating, where he's getting his chances by, from per 60 last year was actually the best season of his career at 1.15 XG uh, per 60 individual expected goals per 60 minutes of ice time this year, as of right now in the 13 games so far this year, this is second uh in terms of that and i mean uh they're all ahead of his 30 goal seasons and so he's getting looks and it's just he's not scoring and honestly he's scored what one goal so far this year if i'm remembering correctly um uh, let me just double check yeah one goal so far this year shooting two percent if he keeps getting these looks like he did for instance in overtime against the sharks he's gonna bury those it, it's just gonna happen goal scoring streaky in the nhl I think if you're a Ducks fan, instead of being frustrated with Ricard Raquel not finishing those chances, I think you should be more positive about it. The fact that he's getting these looks and he has the skill level that he's eventually going to start finishing them and they're going to come in droves. As Tammy Solani once put, goal scoring is like a bo bottle of ketchup. Once it comes out, it's all going to start coming out. And so that's how goal scoring is. It's streaky. That's why we say look at the percentages. You can outshoot what you should be doing, but eventually you'll end up right in the range that you should be. 
And that's because it's so streaky. And so the fact that he's getting these looks sets him up to go on a run like that. And so you want a guy to be able to get in, get to get these looks. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at with Raquel. Uh, let's blitz through. You had two more questions. Let's do those quick so we can eventually get to Twitch because Twitch is rolling. Um, basically said, is the only real option for a first line, a uh, first line center at the draft? Well, it's hard to get a first-line center in the NHL if you don't draft them because outside of that, uh, you can try to sign one through free agency. But in free agency, you're not going to get them when they're entering their primes. You're going to get them when they're kind of either firmly in it or exiting their primes, and you're going to have to pay a huge premium for them. Or you're going to have to trade, and that's pretty difficult to do. Teams don't want to give things up. And, I mean, we saw that with the Pierre-Luc Dubois situation so uh yeah i mean it's kind of that's the way you got to do it most of the time is through the draft yep uh 100 agree it's just the simplest way and then is sam Steele really a winger i think he'd be more effective on actually, the way. <laughs> yeah and i was actually gonna bring that up on the last um thing but we didn't get around to it where i I'm starting to think that right now, if nothing else, I, I think ideally in a perfect world, I would love to see Sam Steele as a center. As a, like To me, if all goes perfectly with Sam Steele and if he rebounds and kind of hits his expectations, I think he's a great, perfect second-line center, right? But where he is right now, that's clearly not happening. So I actually would not mind seeing him get moved to the wing, if nothing else, but to maybe get some of that confidence, lessen those defensive responsibilities a little bit, let him focus on the simpler parts of his game, let him simplify it and see if you can get him going that way. And then at that point, you can kind of make a decision. Look, do we want to go the Raquel way where we keep him on the wing and keep him away from center? Or do we want to try and shift him back and build him back up? He's still young enough to where I think you have the opportunity to be able to go that route um but at this point i think that it would probably be best for him if you shifted him to the wing all right so let's get to these two questions from twitter spencer woods asks us question for the pod why does the coaching staff do nothing about perimeter passing on the power play we didn't really get into too much power play talk uh, on on this show yet so let's do it why do you think the the it's a lot of perimeter play isn't it on the power play and do you think it's a coaching strategy? I mean, Felix, I know you had some uh, tweets about the the coaching staff and that it hasn't changed in a long, long time uh, for the power play. And so, I mean, do you think it's a strategy or just the, the personnel? Oh, man. Why are you going to put me on the spot like that? That's what I do here. That's what I do here. I think it's I think it's always it's always going to be it's not it's not ever one or the other. I think that there's. You know, the Ducks aren't overflowing with elite offensive talent, but I don't think you need elite offensive talent to just have like an okay power play. And the Ducks, you know, I mean, whatever their percentage says right now, they don't, they haven't really been that great at generating quality looks consistently. And yeah, I think that it is a strategy because we saw that strategy last season as well, where they just work it around, work it around the perimeter. And eventually, I guess when they just get bored, or they realize they're running out of time. They just shoot this kind of harmless point shot. And most of the time, there's just not going to be any traffic. So it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, I think that the, this coaching, the, 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 co- you know, the coaching staff, as it pertains to the power play for the last couple of years, has not changed. Mark Morrison has been in charge of it. And their power play hasn't been good throughout that entire process, throughout that entire timeline. And I don't think that it's... I just don't I don't think it's a coincidence anymore. And I really do think that they just don't really seem to have a a good plan. They seem to have ideas to start every season. They seem to try stuff and then they quickly abandon it once it it, it doesn't work. So, yeah, I'm very low on on the way that they're handling the power play. It just seems to be totally I mean. It's it's like they don't even want to you know they they don't even try to to get high quality chances they're just content with getting these 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 low chance opportunities in the name of hey well you know we got to simplify we we got to simplify because we're not going right now but then what happens is simple simple just becomes your mo and you don't actually ever try to uh, really establish the ideals that you were shooting for in the very beginning so. Um, yeah, I'm not impressed by it at all. And I do think that a lot of it has to do with coaching. 
Yeah, I, I would agree. The thing that baffles me, and one of the reasons why I was excited for Dallas Aikens to take over the Ducks, was that his power plays in San Diego looked night and day different from what they look like here at the NHL level. At San Diego, they had a lethal power play. You had guys dropping down low. You had guys cycling the puck all over the place. You had cross-ice passes galore, one-timers, getting the goalie out of position. It was fantastic. And, yeah, maybe that just has to speak of something that the, that the, the goals have always had good AHL talent, but then, you know, when they make the NHL, that's a completely different ball game as far as competitive level goes. But we just haven't even seen that system. And like Felix said, even if you don't necessarily have these elite players on your power play, you can still run that kind of system that like Eakins had going down in San Diego and you would at least be mediocre, like right in the middle of this, of the rankings there. So I don't know if that's Mark Morrison. I know, I don't know if part of that's Eakins. It may be both. I think that Eakins as the head coach, definitely deserves some of the blame here. Um, but you're right. It's definitely not working. The simple, I loved your simple comment where that kind of becomes the MO, right? And it's just their power play, and it has been, and this is almost the same system that they were running under Carlisle, which is really scary. Well, yeah, scary. Morrison is was there the, under Carlisle. <laughs> exactly, which was basically pass the puck around the perimeter, and it's about waiting for somebody to be pulled out of position. They're waiting for another team to make the mistake. If you yep. want to be good on the power play, you have to make the other yep. team make the mistake. You have to pull apart the coverage, right? And you do that with puck movement. You do that with cross ice passes. You do that with actual shooting threats on the wings. And we just don't see any of that right now. And it's maddening because that we saw a completely different system in San Diego with when Eakins was there. Yep. All right, so let's move well, on. With... And j oh, j just ahead. to quickly add, I will just say that if you look at the Ducks stats uh, on the power play, so just five on four power play, they're 23rd in, um, or sorry, 21st in expected goals for per 60 on the power play, which is pretty much where they've been the, like this entire time, both under Aikens and under, under mm -hmm. Carlisle with Morrison. And they jump up to 15th when you look at shot attempts per 60 on the power play. But to me, the expected goals for kind of tells that's more the important. more accurate story. Yeah, exactly. Because on the power mm -hmm. play, how much does it really matter that you're just getting shot attempts? Now, when you look at goals for per 60, what they've actually managed to convert on, uh, they're th the Ducks are dead last in the NHL yeah. in goals for per 60 on the power play. So that'll probably come around if you look at the quality they're generating. But by the same token the way that they're actually going away from generating high quality looks and really fixating on just shooting from the point may actually make it harder for them to bounce out of that because they're reducing their, their likelihood that they score on these shots. So anyway, it's uh, it's a mess. Yeah. All right. So we got this question from William Lewis. Then we're on, we'll get to Twitch. Uh, he said he can't really find this, uh, the article, but he thought he remember recalled the Samuel A said that they would want some sort of stability through the next expan expansion draft in regards to Bob Murray when he was given the extension. And he wants to know, does that really matter? And do we have any faith that this will be better than the expansion draft uh, against Vegas? So quick hit. Do you think the stability matters when it comes to the expansion draft? Uh, CJ, you first. <sighs> That's a really good question. Um, I would say no, because even if you do bring on interim people or you bring in a new person before the expansion draft, you as the owners do have the ability to go through and say, we want a new voice at the helm here, but we would prefer we've already made so many of these plans. We've already have this you know, plan that kind of goes through. If you really want to stick with the plan, you can do that with new voices in the room. And I think we've seen in the past how much just even a new voice um, uh impact a hockey team i think we saw that when carlisle was fired and murray took over behind the bench there the 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 mood in the room the mood around the team got so much better they played better but they weren't it wasn't like a night and day difference they still weren't a great team even when murray took over right but there was a definite change there as they kind of went through that and so i think you can kind of see the same thing that if you put in a new gm and especially if 
indeed, what you have going on right now is the fact that Martin Madden almost seems like, and I don't have any inside knowledge on this, but it almost seems like Martin Madden is being groomed for potential Bob Murray's replacement, right? Like it, it came out uh, this off season that Seattle wanted to interview uh, Martin Madden for uh, a position with them and the Ducks basically said no and then gave him the promotion to assistant GM to combat that which tells me that look they see Madden at the very least as very important to the future of the Ducks possibly more so than Murray and so I think that given the way that the Ducks office is currently set up I don't necessarily think that stability as far as who is at the helm is super important um, at the current moment, unless they think something is extremely broken and they need to pivot extremely soon. But I feel like that's kind of, that may be a stretch. Felix, any thoughts? Anything to add? I mean, it's not that complicated. Protect the correct players and don't lose value for nothing. Yep. Like and you, yeah. <laughs> you don't really need stability for that. You just need someone who understands the rules and, and here's, he's not an idiot. Well, and here's my view on it. I actually think a fresh set of eyes is better for it than having stability because you're yes. not loyal well, to your also, players. Well, yeah, that's yeah. the other thing is that you're not going to overvalue guys yep. just because they've been around. Yep. Like, I mean, this is what happened with the Ducks. But like I've said before on this show, this upcoming expansion draft is not really that big for the ducks. There's not really any big potential losses that they can have. So it's just, it's just, you know, people have trauma built up from the last one. And I understand that. Yep. But this, this upcoming one is not that big of a deal. So let's get into Twitch. Yeah. So for those of you watching the uh, recorded version of this on YouTube or listening to the podcast audio version, we do a live stream of the show each and every time at twitch.tv slash crash the pond where you can help support the show. If you have Amazon Prime, you get one free Twitch Prime sub each and every time uh, or one free, free Twitch Prime sub each and every month. You do have to hit that subscribe button after 30 days. It helps the show significantly. So Caleb Halley asked a question. Do you think the Ducks front office is keeping Zegras in San Diego so that he develops what beyond what would be required to be an NHL or in order to shoot from being a Calder finalist slash winner to improve the look of a fran- of the franchise. I think it, I, it, it, it it's I an alternate no view of it. I actually have a no, thought on this. I think it's I, the- I don't I don't think so. I think that they're doing it just because they don't think he fits on the current team. They really want to take that slow approach. Um that's kind of my view of it. I don't know. I, I think that they really don't think that he's necessarily ready for the NHL completely yet. He's not a Bob um, Murray type player. He's not. And that's the thing with Trevor Zegers. If you watch him play, like he does stuff that definitely could piss off an old school type because he, he, yeah. he tries stuff and he's, um, you know, he's not like this, you know, immensely physical defender. You know, he's, he fills his lanes. He, his stick is in good position. But he doesn't do those things that I think really gets an old school type like Bob Murray going. Um, So I just think they view him as like, hey, he needs a little development. Now, I would challenge that and say he's lighting up the AHL already. Like, how much does it really matter? And also, you know, Martin Madden is supposedly this great development guy who has this great eye for talent. Why can't he get in Murray's ear and say, hey, you know what? This uh, this guy maybe should have a shot. But maybe Martin Madden agrees with him. Who knows? Um, That being said. I do think on the Zegras topic, whether he's in the NHL right now or the AHL, I don't know how much it completely matters because I I think that he does stand to benefit from being in, in the AHL. Like I don't think it's a waste of his time because either way, there are some things in his game that he could improve and he can do that in the AHL or the NHL. I mean, I think at the very worst, he'll be he'll be in the lineup next season. Anyway, that that's my two cents on it. Yeah, I, I'm wondering. I'm wondering with Zegers if there's a bit of um, fear from Bob Murray, given his history with calling up prospects too early. Like he's, uh, you know, Bob Murray has come on record and mentioned that he brought up Cam Fowler too early, um, and even that he probably brought up Nick Ritchie too early. I know there's a lot of revisionist history, I think, with Nick Ritchie, but if you guys remember, Nick Ritchie tore it up with San Diego, like his first like third of the season, and I remember Ducks fans, including myself, were clamoring for Bob to call up Nick Ritchie. 
um, due to how well he was performing in San Diego. And if you actually look back at the numbers, he wasn't like he was good, but he wasn't like otherworldly. It just kind of like seemed like it, I think, at the time. Um, but I do wonder if Murray is is terrified of bringing him up too early because look, even though Zegers looks like he's way better than everybody else in the AHL so far, it's only what a couple of games so far, a few preseason games. So number one, that's a small sample size. But number two, again, the skill jump from the AHL to the NHL is significant, right? It's not like he's, you know, they're like, oh, he's doing great in the AHL. He's immediately going to, you know, be a, a star at the NHL and start start producing. Has he earned a look up at the NHL? Maybe, and I think there's an argument to be made with that. But I do agree with Felix that I don't think he's wasting his time in the AHL. I personally believe that, look, if I was in Murray's position, I would probably be calling up Zegers right now. But him being in the AHL, I think, definitely is a benefit. The AHL is a higher skill level than the juniors and the college um, path that he had taken previously. Um, he's getting used to different things, and there are still certain things that he can work on in his game. And so um, I, I, I don't think it's a giant travesty that he's not up yet. But if he keeps going the way that he's going to go, you may see him force Murray's hand here sooner rather than later. Yeah, I just I I'm just gonna say I disagree mainly because Bob Murray. Yeah, yes, you're right. He said that, but for him, it's situational. It's whenever he wants to make that comment, he makes that comment. Look at Isaac Lundstrom. Look at Max Comtois. Max Comtois played in the NHL at 18, and, and and Murray was pissed that he couldn't send him to the AHL. Isaac Lundstrom played a shit ton of games at 18 and, and is one and played a bunch at 19, playing at 20. It the, that logic applies whenever Murray wants it to apply and doesn't apply when he doesn't want it to apply. So that I, I, I 100% agree with that. And, and so that, that <laughs> that's like, why, why is, is, that's I, really good why is Isaac Lindstrom a fixture? I think this is partially the coaching thing too. Cause I, I think that you can't a hundred percent put this on Murray. I, I know that that might, no, yeah, a, true. The shock. I think Dallas mm-hmm. Akins is a problem with, well, I don't want to say a problem, but like, I think that he really shies away from adding, these skilled type players into his lineup and he really cares about the internal politics of the team where he doesn't want to have a teenager come in and leapfrog like a Max Jones or something like that. Like, I think that that's really important to him. And I get that because he's having to deal with these guys on a daily basis. He's having to hear the complaints. He's having to hear guys whining for ice time. Right. And then, so I understand that, but at the same time, if Trevor Zegras demonstrates that he gives you the best opportunity to win, none of that stuff should really matter yep. at all. I mean, um, he, here's the thing. I mean, look, look at it. Look at how, and this is completely separate, but look at how he handled Daniel Sprong last year. I mean, didn't give him a chance at all. And I would argue that D- Daniel Sprong, whenever he played, showed that he was clearly good enough to make this team, to make the Ducks a better team. So uh, this is also an Aikens issue, not just Bomber. Yeah. And just for the record, Trevor, yeah, Ze- Trevor Zegers has played in six AHL games. I'm considering the preseason games AHL games because at the end of the day, there probably isn't a playoffs this year. And John will probably talk about that a little bit when we get to kind of his, his little portion at the end of this all. Um, but so it, it's essentially the same between the preseason. And Zegers has, I think, 11 points in, in six games in, in the AHL. He, he's almost at two points per game so far in the AHL. And so if you want to look at proving it, showing that he can do it, I mean, I don't know what more he can do than that. He he's producing better than really anyone we've seen in the duck system in a long time. And so I, I would actually argue he's showing that he's probably too good offensively for the AHL at this point in time with the way that he's producing. And I think at a certain point, it could be a detriment to his game in a, if he plays the entire year down there. That's just my view of it. All right. So let's kind of move on. We got a bunch of questions. Let, let's just kind of blitz through these. Kempafu, this one I'll just take because it's quick and easy. Are there any rookies really lighting it up this year? Maybe Kaprasov. He says, I think Zegers could have been a good runner for the caller this year. Kaprasov's leading the league right now with nine points in 11 games. And he's kind of right. No one's really separated themselves. And so Zegers, if he had played, if he would have been producing like he has in the AHL, I looked it up through NHL E, two points per game would come out to around a point per game from AHL to NHL. He'd have a shot at the the Calder with kind of how it's shaping up right now. So it's interesting on that front. All right, so here's this question from Ang Young. Of course, I'm in the the bunch of wanting to bring up Zegers and wonder what Bob is doing. A lot of our questions, obviously, are Zegers related. He's the hot button topic for a lot of people. Uh, but he's a, but my thing is Zegers is playing the wing. Whose spot do you think he would take? Obviously, it wouldn't be the fourth line, so it would have to be take over one of Terry Silverberg, Raquel, Comtois, Henrique, Heinen, and then Jones and Milano who are out. So I just don't know who you would take out. Lundestrom. 
Yeah. Yeah, easily. Take out Lundstrom, move Henrik to Sam the center. Move, move Henrik to center. Why is Sam Steele like a staple on this on this team? What yeah. what has he shown? To, yeah. to to I mean, if any, I mean, man, now maybe I'm going too far, but why isn't Sam Steele the one in the AHL right now? I mean, Sam Steele has been well, yeah. really productive I mean, in the AHL, um, and maybe he has nothing left to prove there. But well, it's remember been, last year, yeah. like Sam Steele was the only kid who wasn't sent down to the AHL. Everybody else has Troy Terry, Jones, Comtois. They've all been yeah. sent down. Steele hasn't. And and it's not only that. Like Steele doesn't even really get scratched. Like. Terry has a bad game and he's in the doghouse immediately. Um, whereas Sam Steele just, he, he just has like a hex over this coaching staff where he, they just don't <laughs> seem to find any flaw in his game. It's, I mean, well, it's not that they, someone who's as loyal to you as Aikens is to Steele. <laughs> well, it's not that they don't see a flaw because they've been pretty, I mean, Aikens has been vocal that they, he does see issues, but he just doesn't, he doesn't use any of his hammers, you know, in terms of ice time or anything like that. Uh, to try to remedy the situation because you know he's such a good kid that must be it right mm-hmm. he's a great guy all right so let's Same with Derek Grant. let's get to let's do three more questions from twitch then we'll get to the ask, hashtag ask the ask the nest uh dalton key said do you think the youngsters of ducks of the ducks like terry comtois and lundstrom are feeling the pressure of zegras tearing up the ahl fearing they may lose a spot to him soon do you think that has any factor on no. we, we've seen improved play from lundstrom or from uh all those guys no Fair enough. No. Fair enough. <laughs> we're, we're, worth asking. I don't know. It's it's a question worth asking. All right, so we'll hit these two more from uh, I think B- that's fair. B1 Somdi48. It's a question. What core or quote-unquote core players would you choose to trade away at before this year's deadline or draft? All of them. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I would trade. I would trade Raquel because I think he has the most value. I would try to trade Henrique and I would try to trade Manson and I think that's probably it, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I would agree there. Maybe Miller, if he's willing to waive the note, I know that's been an issue in the past. Um, maybe that, you know, maybe things change. If things have changed, then you can look at Miller. But um, I think Manson is going to be harder to get value for given his injury now but i would agree at this point raquel has the most value and i think at this point the ducks contention window isn't really going to line up that well with the rest of raquel's prime so i think i'm with you there yeah and real quick ryan miller doesn't that's a good call by you i doubt that that would happen but he doesn't have a no move clause but he essentially has one bob bob murray wouldn't move him unless he, he wants does, to be moved yeah. so hockey boys exactly. asks with what we've seen so far what do you think bob murray does at the deadline Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> trade Carter Rowney for a mid pick. Trade 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 like one yeah. of the younger players for another younger player who's struggling on his team. Trade trade Troy Terry for someone yeah. that that is a shuffling of Tra- a deck. Trade trade Troy Terry for Ryan Donato or something. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I, what? At thanks. this point, like Bob Bob Murray's hallmark is the shuffling of deck chairs and. I, as much as I would like to say that this year is different and will spur him to make a more dramatic move, I'm just, I'm, I'm not confident. Well, yeah. we'll see because these Vegas games coming up and Minnesota <laughs> could, could, uh, could get the wheels back in motion. Yep. So, uh, with that being said, let's move on to kind of the final segment and then we'll wrap this thing up of. Uh, for this podcast so we asked our good friend john brabant who's over at defend the nest uh i asked him a question that he gave me an answer to of basically give us a primer of where the ahl is right now and so uh right now i'm gonna actually play that for you what he said about that all and you'll be able to hear his thoughts and we'll actually try to make this a bit of a running thing obviously people are going to be really tuned into the goals this year with the the with Trevor egress being down there so shoot us questions i can ask him and he'll record it and we'll add it on and kind of throughout the show and add discussion points so here we go uh this is uh hashtag ask the nest giving us a primer on where the the ahl is currently and kind of what to expect from it oh uh i actually cannot play it right now so it will get sorry for people watching the youtube video or the twitch stream uh it will get looped in at the very end of the audio podcast uh so apologies for that john 
there's something going on actually with the audio version of it for some reason. Let me see one sec. Actually, nope, scratch that. I can do it. Don't worry. I, I, I'm i the... You I, good there, Jake? You good? It, 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 it's been a weekend. I think I've got this. Give me <laughs> one sec here, folks. We believe in you. All right, here we go. Hey, Let, let's do it this How way. Here going? it is. Um, so good to hear from that, Jazz. Um, just sorry, bringing up your question. I'm doing this from work. Hopefully it doesn't echo too much in here. Um, so your question is, what is the current status of the AHL? More specifically, the Pacific Division. What teams are left? How many games will the girls play? Basically kind of any and all important info for the upcoming season. Um, first off, let me just direct your subtle plug uh, to defendthenest.com, where I have recently put up a season preview for the goals, which breaks down all of their division opponents, pretty much their only opponents this season, um, and take a wild stab at how I feel the standings will shape out by season's end. No spoilers, you've got to go see the article to see what I think. Um, but back to the original question. So the AHL, um, I don't know if you've been following the news, but it's had, starting off, it had three teams drop out. Um, those were the Charlotte Checkers, which is the Florida Panthers affiliate, the Milwaukee Admirals, which is the Predators affiliate, and the Thunderbirds, which is the Blues' newest affiliate. Um, and in order to distribute those players left over from those teams, uh, various clubs have made deals. So the Blues cut a deal with the Canucks, um, pretty savvy of them, uh, and so their players have gone to Utica, um, the Predators, sorry, I'm just reading up on what I put because I'm a bit rusty on this now, um, cut a deal with the Hurricanes, so they've sent their players to get it, the Chicago Wolves, which is a bit weird, but yeah, um, there's been some reshuffling around done in the off season, um, so the Wolves are going to be pretty stacked, and the Blues, oh, I've already covered the Blues, sorry. The Panthers, um, in the most unlikely partnership ever, have teamed up with the Lightning. So they've sent their players to Syracuse. Um, so yeah, that's that part of things. Um, the Gulls are playing 44 games total, and that's still counting um, the fact that the Stockton Heat dropped out only last week. So they managed to reschedule and um, ensure they still played 44, even though they would have dropped to 40 um, with the heat dropping out, but they've rescheduled some games against the existing divisional opponents. Um, so they're playing 44 total. Sorry, just bringing up your question again to see what else you asked. Um, yeah, that's... Pretty much all you asked, really. Um, I don't want to give too much away about uh, how I feel things shape out, but I'm super excited by it. Um, I realize that we're not going to have Zegris forever, but I'm hoping we can have him for at least a few games. Um, pretty much the goals could finish... I, I've put them as they could finish second. There's a spoiler for you. But it's if he sticks with them for long enough because their power play is unstoppable with him on it. Uh, right. I think that's enough. If you have any other questions, feel free. And he added okay, more I'll to, add that. to that. So here you go. That, um, the girls in the Pacific are playing, just because I realized that I didn't specify that. They're playing Bakersfield, which is Edmonton's farm club. Um, they're going to have a weird situation this year in that they're, they're a whole closed border away from their parent club. Um, and it's already kind of showing with their goaltending depth in that... Um, they in their preseason game against the goals they used Angus Redmond who used to be in the Ducks system, um, but he could never really get further than the ECHL. Um, so yeah, because of the whole taxi squad squad thing, um, and being a border away, they've actually put two goalies on their taxi squad. Um, so they've left with Redmond and Oliver Olivier Rodrigue, who should be interesting to see because I remember. Uh, putting him when I write, wrote for Anaheim Calling I remember putting him in as a possible dream third round selection for the Ducks so yeah um, of course the Rain which is the Kings farm team and I've picked them to do very very well because it's pretty much unfair how good they are 
Um, Colorado Eagles, who they're the only independently owned uh, franchise in the Pacific. And looking over their roster uh, for my preview, I really quickly realized that they had a lot of good guys leave and haven't really replaced them because they probably couldn't afford to. Um, so, yeah. Then there's the brand new Vegas farm team um, playing out of Henderson. Um, can't really say much about them. It seems to be maybe half the players they had in Chicago um, with a bunch of uh, newly turned pros and also their kids like Peyton, Peyton Krebs. So they should be fun to watch, but I can't really pick how they're going to go, or at least you have to read my article to see. Um, Tucson, which is Arizona's farm team, um, they generally do well every year, but I'm actually not sure or I don't pick them to do that well this year. Uh, they seem to have been kind of decimated by call-ups and haven't really filled any holes. They have got Victor Soderstrom making his debut, so I've given them an edge with that, but there's no nobody else to really back them up. Um, and if I covered everybody, oh, except for the Barracuda, San Jose's team, um, who I didn't rate them very much at the, in the preseason, um, and they've not been good for a couple of years now, but... This season, I don't... Like, they could surprise. San Jose's done some weird thing where they've absolutely stacked them with every single player that they could call upon. Um, it's like they've got no players left overseas. Uh, I think I counted they had 23 forwards or something crazy like that. Um, so, yeah. They will be interesting. And there we go. That's the Pacific Division opponents. All right, and that is it from our good friend over at Defend the Nest, uh, John Brad- Broadbent. Go follow him at Defend the Nest on uh, Twitter. So I think that's probably going to do it for us tonight, though. Yep, let's uh, let's get on out of here and uh, give you a few ways that you can support our show. So the number one, I think this is number one. F- feel free to disagree. We have a Patreon page, so patreon.com slash crash the pond so we've got uh, a few different ways for you to support us there which i think all of them definitely have uh their perks so for one dollar a month a one dollar a month pledge you get access to our patrons only discord chat which has really taken on a life of its own this season um you know you get to connect with other diehard ducks fans especially when there's breaking news and during games uh you get your own uh basically your own kind of private chat and everybody in there uh, has a really great attitude. I mean, nobody is in there to troll or anything like that. So it's a lot of fun. That's for $1 a month for $5 a month. You do also get access to two bonus episodes a month. So on top of the shows that we do here, you'll also get access to uh, two bonus episodes a month where we talk about whether it's league wide topics, doing league wide rankings, uh, go more in depth on ducks topics, or sometimes as both you know, both of you know, just completely unrelated. So if you enjoy kind of the the banter of the show, I think that that's a great place uh, for you to kind of tune in and get a little more of that. We also introduced a new tier, um, and this is something that I think we've been thinking about for a long time, but that is really exciting. So for fifteen dollars a month, you get all the perks that we just talked about, but you also get access to our watch along. And so that'll be where um, I think is it twice a month, Jake, that yes. we're doing right now. And yeah, so twice a twice a month, we'll be doing a broadcast of Ducks games where we'll essentially be giving you an al- an alternate commentary feed that you can tune into with the chat. Yep. And there's a post on the Patreon right now. If you are subscribed to that tier, put in there what type of game you which game you want to see it do it see us do it on. We still have to decide. Uh, which ones we're going to do for the rest of the month uh, for the two. So let us know, and, and we can pick and choose wh- which ones to go with. Yep, so that's at patreon.com slash crash the pond. Now, if you're not on Patreon or if money's a little tight, that's totally understandable. Uh, still a bunch of different ways that you can support us. Uh, just search for Crash the Pond on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a rating and a review, and uh, we'll actually read your review on the show we love hearing from you guys and those reviews really do go a long way uh we've also got shirts going on right now and so i don't know if uh 
for those of you that are watching on our Twitch stream right now, twitch.tv slash crash the pond or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash crash the pond. Got these pretty sweet t-shirts um, and they're extremely comfortable. They've got our logo on them. We've got a few different models. We've got an eggplant version, which you can get in different colors. Um, it's our logo with more of a an original Mighty Ducks theme uh, in terms of the colors. And we've also got the orange colors. We've got hoodies, T-shirts, uh, and you can get all of that at CrashThePond.com slash shop. So I'm sure you two have been enjoying your uh, your Crash the Pond apparel as much as I have. Yes, it's very nice. <laughs> love love yeah. rocking the brand. Love rocking I love it. the... I love the eggplant logo especially because, you know, we talk so much about how we love the Ducks original color palette. And so um, it's a good look. And that's at CrashThePond.com slash shop. But like I was just talking about, um, you know, if if you're not on Apple Podcasts, you can also check us out on Spotify. Uh, we post our episodes there, the, the audio version. We are also on YouTube, YouTube.com slash CrashThePond. Make sure to subscribe there and turn on your notifications so that you can see when our show goes up, make sure to check out our website. Just overall, crashthepond.com. We've got a fun new series this season where after each um, mini series that the Ducks are doing, uh, you know, so for example, against the Sharks this weekend, we do five takeaways. Uh, so five kind of main points or things that stood out to us. And uh, all three of us here on the show are writing these. So you get to hear all of our voices. And, um, you know, it's a look at analytics or... Um, just kind of how the coaching staff is using different players. It's really detailed, and that's over at CrashThePond.com. Um, you can also check us, check out Crash the Pond on social media. Crash the Pond is on Facebook, Crash at Crash the Pond on Twitter. CJ is on Twitter, at CJ Woodling. Jake is on Twitter, at ReindeerGames91. And I am on Twitter, at Felix underscore Sicard. So, guys, did I, did I forget anything there? Anything else that we should throw in here? Nope. Okay. Well, hey, on that it. note, <laughs> on that note, everybody, have a great week, and we will talk to you at the next show.